Good morning. Here are your announcements. Walk with Christ and be baptized. Sign up on a connection card or at thewayberkeley.com slash connect. Be prepared to attend the baptism class, which happens on the day you're baptized. We commit to helping you grow as a Christian. Sign up for the available live groups at thewayberkeley.com slash grow. Get a free session with a licensed clinician by signing up at thewayberkeley.com. Join your friends who have expanded their service to our community. You can serve for a term on one of our ministry teams. Sign up at thewayberkeley.com slash grow in order to serve. Join us for a special time of intercessory prayer to undergird the upcoming protest happening in the Bay Area next weekend. Prayer is this Wednesday at 7 p.m. here at The Way. Let's protest with our feet and stay vigilant in prayer. What are the ways in which we create a space of hope in really difficult situations? How do we create opportunities for young people who live in situations that are really treacherous? Join us in this discussion of healing and urban education. Come to the final session of our Hope and Healing Summer Series of Books and Breakfast. Sean Jenright will share the findings from his recent book. Books and Breakfast is Saturday, August 26th from 10 a.m. to noon. Take the journey with Brittany Richardson as she tells the story of a woman who suffers childhood sexual abuse, finds healing and community through the arts, and moves to Africa to use the arts to bring healing to other exploited young girls. Art and Abolition is on Thursday, August 31st at 8 p.m. You can access these updates and more at thewayberkeley.com. Enjoy your week. All right, turn with us to the book of Amos, chapter number five. We are going through a series of foundations, a series on foundations, and uh, we're certainly uh, doing a little bit of a, of a, uh, uh, what are we doing? We're doing a little bit of a a curve in uh, what we initially had planned, given the the terrible nature of what's happening in the world, but yet I'm still finding that what we'll talk about today is foundational to what it means for us to be followers of Jesus uh, in a world and in a time where uh, we are in need of Jesus' followers to be faithful, faithful in the public space, faithful uh, in everywhere and environment we occupy. And so this is going to be a, a sermon that will uh, give you and I hopefully a little bit of a challenge around how we are to respond when hate resonates. When hate resonates, how are you to respond? We're going to talk today about love-hate relationships. And um, uh, yeah, the, 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 the text we're going to start in is the book of Amos. Now, Amos was one of these minor prophets, according to the Hebrew scriptures, uh, one of these prophets who, who had a particular call from God. Amos, uh, when he heard the voice of God come speak to him, Amos uh, responded uh, pretty quickly. But what Amos was doing when God spoke to him was not uh, ministry, so to speak. Amos was someone who tended to trees. Amos was engaged in his own, say, uh, uh, marketplace job, if you will, the place where he uh, was, you know, on the, one could argue he was on the fast track to the corner office by tending trees. (laughs) Yep, that's, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. He was, he was, he was someone who, who was not um, every day for his life being prepared to do priestly or prophetic ministry. But when the voice of God called to Amos, Amos literally had to stop what he was doing and respond in real time to the voice of God. Amos should be distinguished from other prophets like Isaiah or Jeremiah or Elijah or Elisha, these prophets who actually went Uh, into a prophetic lifelong ministry uh, because it's so important to appreciate 
that God can call you for your whole life to do a certain ministry or God can call you for a season. But when God calls you, you got to say yes to God. And, and, and this is, I think, a, a, a very important uh, a backdrop for this, not only sermon, but for this season that we're in as a country, as a people, dare I say, not only uh, in, in, in real time, but certainly in the larger world, that God is calling everybody to do something beyond what you do nine to five. Mm-hmm. Hopefully what you do in nine to five is pleasing God as well. Man, hopefully you, you're not doing stuff during your nine to five that you got to go repent for every time you go home or when you come to church. You come to church to kind of like, you know, get it out your system so you can go do a whole nother week's worth of nine to five that just makes you not feel like you are moving in God's will and purpose and power. But certainly there is a call from God that I want to argue, particularly in this moment, that we all are being asked to respond to. And uh, hopefully this passage of scripture gives us a little bit of a framework for how you and I may and can respond to God. Amos chapter number uh, five is where we're going to head. And we're going to start at verse number four. We're going to do a little bit of, of, of working through this uh, passage in the interest of time. I'm not going to read the whole passage, but you should read Amos chapter five, like probably, I don't know, once every week. And just make sure that you are like doing and re- living uh, out this very powerful call. Isn't it interesting that God can speak to you one time, call you to do something one time, and that one thing can, can linger and have an impact for all of eternity? Man, because, you know, this tree tender got a call from God, and now people don't even know him for what he was doing every day. They know him for what God spoke to him. When he said yes, you ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell them uh, respond when God says yes. Respond when God says yes. Respond when God says yes. All right. Verse number four uh, of Amos chapter five. I think it should be on the screen. Look at there it is. All right. Here we go. I'm reading from the message translation. This is God's message to the family of Israel. Seek me and live. Don't fool around at those shrines of Bethel. Mm, now, now, you know, you could plug that into a whole lot of things, right? right. <laughs> Don't fool around at those shrines of Bethel or white supremacy or nationalism or greed or racism or all the phobias or capitalism. Don't fool around at the idols. We think we talked about that last week, right? How these high places must come down. Anybody tear down some high places in your life this week? I don't know a few idols, amen, all right? Thank God for those one or two people. Amen. God bless you. So we probably need to preach this every week till everybody's hands go up. Amen. Because how many know it's hard to serve two masters? I think Jesus said that somewhere. All right. But that's a sermon for another day. Don't fool around at those shrines of Bethel. Don't waste time taking trips to Gilgal. And don't bother going down to Beersheba. Gilgal is here today and gone tomorrow, and Bethel is all show and no substance. My, my, my. I don't know, I don't know what you can put in there that would resonate for you. But how many know all of us got a Gilgal? Here today and gone tomorrow. Anybody got any, anything like that in your life? Any of y'all invested in something like that? You thought this was a lifelong investment. And it was like 10 minutes later. You were like, wow, that, that, that went real quick. Anybody got a Bethel in your life? All show. No substance. Man. Ah. Verse number six. So see God and live. You don't want to end up with nothing to show for your life but a pile of ashes a house burned to the ground, for God will send just such a fire, and the firefighters will show up too late. Ooh, these prophets, boy. (laughs) Woe to you who turn justice to vinegar and stomp righteousness into the mud. Go down to verse number 10. 
people hate this kind of talk. I can understand why. Raw truth is never popular. But here it is, bluntly spoken. Because you run roughshod over the poor, take the bread right out of their mouths, you're never going to move into the luxury homes you have built. You're never going to drink wine from the expensive vineyards you've planted. I know precisely the extent of your violations, the enormity of your sins, appalling. You bully right-living people, taking bribes right and left, and kicking the poor when they're down. Justice is a lost cause. Evil is epidemic. Decent people throw up their hands. Protest and rebuke are useless, a waste of breath. Seek good and not evil and live. You talk about the God of the angel armies being your best friend? Well, live like it, and maybe it will happen. Hate evil, love good, then work it out in the public square. And maybe God, the God of the angel armies, will notice your remnant and be gracious. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Verse number 15, we're going to kind of ground much of our sermon in this one verse. Hate evil, love good, then work it out in the public square. We'll talk about love-hate relationships. Bow your heads with us. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. Please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. All right. Now, it's important to... Uh, start off this sermon with certainly uh, an important frame, I believe, around how hate and love have a very interesting and uh, uh, braided relationship in our day-to-day -day lives. Because I have found that all of us, when we take seriously the role and the presence of evil and good, of hatred and love, of these polar seemingly opposites. I think there was an old school movie called A Thin Line Between Love and Hate. That you can get to hate pretty quick. Um, often with the folks that you thought you loved. Conversely, you can get to hate pretty quick, often with the things that you thought that you loved. Part of what I am finding is that there is a call for us, the people of God, to wrestle with hate, to wrestle with love. To not be some of these folk who are so quick to discount the presence of hate in our own lives because our hatred does not look as unacceptable as someone else's hatred does. I mean, it's so fascinating how all of us can particularly, you know, attribute love to God and love to Jesus but when you look at the way we who follow Jesus or follow the ways of God live, there's a thin line between the perception of others as it relates to love and hate. I mean, it is indeed the case that the evil of these last couple weeks, at least the public expression of it, has moved our country into a reckoning of sorts where people are quickly 
trying to distance themselves from the public hatred made concrete by the Ku Klux Klan and the white nationalists and the Nazis. And we should, because that kind of hatred is ugly. And it has no place in a public space. I mean, I feel like if you hate folks that much, you need to hate them at home. <laughs> Hallelujah. But when you start bringing all that hatred outside, your private hate can become a public terror. And I don't care who you are, nobody should be subjected to the private hatred in a public space. Right, Hallelujah. I don't care what your issue or discontent is, you and I must be people who reject hatred whenever hatred shows up. Not start splicing it and, you know, trying to make sense of it or trying to argue it away. No, hatred must be confronted. Um, and yet, it is important for us to not let ourselves off the hook, though, about how we all have to wrestle with history, a history that demonstrates the thin line between love and hate. You and I have to wrestle with world history, a history of the world that has obviously shown us that if you take a look at civilization over the millennia or eons of time, that there is a lot of evidence of people engaging in all kind of hatred towards the other. And it's important for you and I to not be ignorant to the kind of historical hatred that often lies beneath the surface of many of our cultures, our backgrounds, our religious traditions, that hatred don't just pop up and then everybody's surprised unless you just have amnesia or you are ignorant to the way hatred lingers in the hearts of many, if not all of us. We have to struggle with the history, wrestle with the history of hatred in the church, that some kinds of church expression at its worst has been a fuel to the hatred that are in some people's hearts. The folks can read the same scriptures and come out with all kinds of fuel to hate somebody else. I mean, I was reading or listening to K K Katie Couric's uh, uh, little 20-minute thing she did about the folk in Charlottesville, all the nationalists and whatnot, and, and it's so fascinating uh, because they were appealing to Scripture, the white nationalists, about why they are so filled with uh, this kind of uh, hatred and disdain for Jewish folk. And one of them said, well, what about black people? He said, well, you know, they're just the blacks. I said, all right, well, there, there it is, the blacks, thank God. <laughs> Remember Barack Obama was talking about that. He's like, unless that's a family, amen, that you know, that's not the way to talk about black people, touch your name. <laughs> it's just the blacks. <laughs> just a little lesson for some of us, amen, just, you know. Don't call nobody the blacks. Or... <laughs> but they found some of this hatred, at least by their own recollection or narrative from Scripture. Then, of course, we got national hatred that, you know, is as American as apple pie. Amen. That is, 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 is a, it's a level of hatred and, and, and violence in our country's history that is, you know, people say, oh, that was a long time ago. I was like, I don't know, yesterday seemed pretty, uh, pretty, 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 pretty recent to me, praise God. And then, you know, we will take it down to the place nobody ever wants to deal with, and that's the personal hatred. 
that we often carry around unprocessed, undealt with, and not looked at for what it is. I want you and I to appreciate that there is something in our DNA as people, certainly in the Christian theological tradition, we talk about uh, that we are a fallen people, meaning we have fallen from grace. We have fallen from God's original intent, that when God created everything in the beginning, God created everything and it was good, meaning that there was no lack. There was no reason for us to be at odds with one another. All we were called to do were to take good care of that which God created. And over time, of course, we see that the rebellion of, 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 of humanity led to the birth of sin, the birth of this, this capacity now to want what you can't have, to describe and to name and to treat people and things in ways that God did not originally intend. And so we are now left with this reality today where you and I are often faced with a daily dose of hatred. Hatred of people who are not like us. Hatred of people who are not in our country. Hatred of people who don't have as much money as we have. Hatred of people who may have more melanin in our skin or not. Hatred of people who have orientations of their lives and loves and, 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 and worldviews that are different than ours. And it is not like we're just sitting there eating up the hate very cognitively like you eat ice cream and it's like, mm, mm good. But there comes a moment in life, a situation where the reason why there's a thin line between love and hate is because we are being primed to hate people all of the time. And I want to suggest to you, child of God, that part of our task is to be a people who do not subscribe to a beautiful lie. Rather than the ugly truth, because as James Baldwin says, I think I have it up here somewhere. He says, uh, 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 maybe I don't, I don't know, I, I don't, let's see if I can remember. He says that not all things that can be faced, not all things you face can be changed, but nothing you won't face or, or those things you refuse to face will never be changed. That in some respects, if you and I aren't able to be honest about the struggle and the thin lines between love and hate, then we may ourselves not be, you know, experiencing or participating in a public hatred of, say, racialized hatred. But how many of you know we could easily flow or slide or be seduced into another kind of hatred? That is just as diabolical and sinful as the hatred we are seeing playing out for the last few weeks, marching up and down the streets of American cities that many of us are so disturbed by. I want to suggest to you, child of God, that this text is giving you and I some very important directives around how and why and what we must do if we are going to deal with the hate that resonates in our own lives. Because quiet as it's kept, it's easy to reject the hatred shown by the Ku Klux Klan, at least hopefully. <laughs> but how many of you know it's harder to reject the hatred that you have for the Ku Klux Klan, yourself. Not what they are representing, but the actual people themselves. I mean, as I was watching these images, I began to have thoughts in my mind 
that were not grounded in love. Hello, somebody. Amen. I mean, I, 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 I was saying to myself, you know, you know, you ever, you, you see people say, oh, I never could have been a slave back in the day. Or I never could have been, you know, around when, you know, they were that flamboyant because I'd have did, I'd have did this and I'd have did that. Anybody ever said that? You know, I know I said it maybe 10, 15 years ago. And then you get in the moment. And you're realizing, hmm, I have opportunities to do this, opportunities to do that. And then you start to realize, certainly as a follower of Jesus, I start to realize that me allowing hatred for that evil that, that, that gets to a place of physicality and even loss of life is a kind of hatred that God is not pleased with. And certainly Jesus came to deliver us from. So how do you deal with the hatred that you and I are often kind of being spoon fed through culture, through TV, through media, sadly sometimes through church, sadly sometimes through family, sadly sometimes through through, through friends and partners and homies, I want to suggest to you that the scriptures give you and I some clear directives that you and I must take every effort to follow. First thing I want to leave with you, dear loved ones, is that when hate resonates, we must let love liberate. When hate resonates, when you and I start to resonate with hatred, because of what others are doing to you or to those we love, then you and I must make every effort to purposefully unleash love in that space. Now, what's so fascinating about love is that love is about as amorphous as the air. Because everybody says they love everything. People say, I love my sports teams and I love my, my, my friends, and I love my celebrities. I love my music. I love my food. Love, love, love seems to be something so easily uh, thrown around. But how many of you know love is more than a shiver that runs up and down your spine? Hello, somebody. Love is more than something that makes you feel good. Love at its root is about a commitment to the good, that, that, that in many respects will always outdo the kind of feeling you have to do the good. Because Jesus is always our greatest example. When Jesus was going to the cross, Jesus probably did not feel like being whipped and tortured and killed, especially since it was within his power to get out of all of it. But there was such a depth of love for the world that the love concretized by commitment to you and me pushed Jesus beyond what he felt. And I want to submit that the church of Jesus Christ, particularly in this moment, has to be someone and some people who are willing to tap into a love beyond how we feel. Or we will be no different than those whom we despise. Somebody say, I need the Holy Ghost. That's why you need the Holy Ghost. Amen. Because this can't going to be done by you, like, closing your eyes, clicking your heels, and wishing upon a star. This is something that requires the supernatural presence of God in your life. So when you hit your, you know, exhaustion point, the supernatural power of God kicks in and helps you to cross the finish line. So you can get to the place where the love that has 
been extended to you and I can remain present when hatred is attempting to overwhelm everything. Huh. It's a hard thing, you know, because it's easy to hate some folk, praise God. I mean, you know, haters are in abundance. And keep it real, you a hater sometimes, amen. I don't mean no harm, amen. I mean, I love to try to be somewhat trivial because it helps you to, you know, let your guard down so the truth can hit you where it needs to. But don't you know, like, uh, how easy it is for you to be a hater uh, when teams that are beating your team? And it's not like you have any real payoff when they win or lose except for some misplaced emotion. But ain't it something when your team starts to get beat continuously that you become a hater of the team that beats you all the time? I mean, you don't celebrate that team. You know, when the 49ers or the Lakers were just beating everybody when I was growing up, you know, you would meet people from other cities and, you know, you rocking your gear and they would just be upset. It's like, why are you, why are you upset? Like, I thought everybody loved the winner, praise God. It's like, no, not if your winning is at my expense. And it is fascinating because, you know, I remember I was at a football game one time and it was the Chicago Bears, was when Mike Singletary was the coach. And, you know, he's, I want winners. And, you know, he had that big old big thing going on and everybody was all excited. And I was in the Chicago Bears and you added a little bit of liquor to some of these fans. And it takes them over the edge. So I got a question for you. What is the liquor? that takes you over the edge to make you a hater for something that we are commanded and tasked to love. Can, can, can I just have an honest church? Anybody ever felt like, I won't call it liquor, just a catalyst, <laughs> a stimulant, something that pushed you way beyond what you knew God was calling you to do in response to a person, a situation. Anyone ever felt that? Anyone ever had that? Amen? All right. Let, let, let's, let's, let's keep practicing some confession. Moja, I need you to let me preach. Moja, Moja, Moja. Let me preach. <laughs> Anyone felt that this week? Watching the TV or some of the commentary? And you're like, now I know I'm supposed to love some folk. Ooh, but something's pushing me to wish harm on the very people that I am actually being called by God to love. Now, again, I'm going to move off the white supremacists and the nationalists because that's an easier target than what I think you and I must struggle with every day. Because the nationalists and the Ku Klux Klan men and all these other you know, public facing manifestations of evil aren't the biggest threat to the people God has called us to love. I tell folk all the time that in the Bay Area it's so fascinating that there is no Ku Klux Klan, at least that we know of, I mean, how many of y'all eating them hot dogs at Top Dog ever imagine? <laughs> you walking up into Berkeley thinking you around the most progressive, open-minded, and you didn't even know that you had a Klan's member serving you hot dogs. And for some of you, he may have been giving you a little extra sauce on your hot dogs. Mmm. That's why I don't eat hot dogs, praise the Lord. <laughs> How many of you just don't know? You just don't know. And that is the most pernicious part of evil. Is that evil can be right up underneath your nose. 
and you will never know it. You will never know that the evil is present. The scripture says back when Cain and Abel were, were, were engaging in their, 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 their first uh, murder, and Cain murdered Abel, and, and, and Cain tried to hide it, and God told a, uh, Cain that sin, evil, is lurking at the door of your heart. Now, this is in the beginning, y'all. This ain't later on in the scriptures. This in the beginning, like, you know, God created uh, heaven and earth. God created Adam and Eve. Cain kills Abel, and God says, all right. After all I've created, sin, evil is lurking. Y'all know what it means to lurk, right? It's just, it's just, just, just lingering, trying to figure out how to get in. It's lurking. It's lingering at the door of your heart. And what does God tell them? You must overcome it. Don't say that you must eliminate it. You must overcome it, which means to suggest that it will perpetually be there. Think about this for a second. Because as much as I want to overcome hatred and evil and white supremacy and all these isms, it seems to me that no matter what we do and how much progress we think we make, we must overcome it daily. Every day we must make a choice that I will not be an agent of hatred. I will not be an agent of evil. I will not be an agent of death. I will overcome it. Somebody say overcome it, overcome it, overcome it. And so how do you overcome it? Well, I'm going to give you three things that I think the scriptures certainly lift up. Hate evil. Somebody say hate evil. Hate. Now, it's important to appreciate that the, the, the hatred that you and I are prone to have must be channeled towards evil but not towards people now that's probably a lifelong challenge because it's easy to hate people and harder to do the work to hate systems one of our good young prophet, prophetic comrades, uh, 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 Minister Nal Fort, put this out right after uh, Ferguson. He said, I don't hate white people. I hate the system of white supremacy that gives them asymmetrical power and unmerited privilege. I don't hate cops. I hate the pattern of police brutality that systematically harasses and kills black people and other people of color with impunity. I don't hate soldiers, I hate the horror of war that terrorizes the most politically and economically vulnerable among us. I don't hate rich people, I hate the system of capitalism that creates an elite 1% at the expense of the rest of us. It is precisely because of my love for humanity that I get in, enraged at systems that prevent people from flourishing and being free. It's frustrating to see my righteous anger at unjust systems interpreted as hatred for individuals, but it's more frustrating to see the oppressed suffer while those maladjusted to injustice remain silent. I won't be silent. Silence is violence. Minister Nile Ford, prophetic words. Put this out right after we got tear gassed a couple times. It was upset that many of us were out there, you know, not being quiet. And he was trying to help educate that it is not hatred of people, but it is 
the systems that do deserve our ire. And so the first thing that you and I have to get clear on, if we will have a hatred of evil systems and not people, is we have to train ourselves, mind, body, spirit, to recognize the principalities and powers that often order people to engage in systems that peddle hatred. Somebody say, hate evil, hate evil, hate evil. Now, 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 now again, it's so interesting because I remember again, when we were in Ferguson, we were getting arrested. And, and I tell the story, I think, a couple of times about how we all got arrested. But one of the, one of the most interesting things in this, in this whole uh, experience was when we were being processed in this, this woman. She was a white woman that was processing me and my brother and Dr. West and a number of us. And, and she, she started to cry as she was processing us. And she apologized. And she said, you know, uh, I'm sorry that I have to do this. And then she went on to say that my boyfriend, who's a Ferguson police officer, is getting ready to resign from the force because he did not join the force to arrest preachers and children. That's what he said, what she said. And as I sat in the jail cell, upset of my own social location at the time, <laughs> I realized that there are people sitting in jails of systems, participating in something that is against their own, not only interest, but desire to live and work and move freely. And this is why I want you and I, as people of God, to be very clear about hatred. Because the Ku Klux Klan, all these folks, is an easy hatred, but what about the systems of our government and our churches and our communities that make it easy to vote in ways that oppress gentrified neighborhoods in ways that displace, incarcerate in ways that destroy families and communities. Don't you know that is about as ugly as the Ku Klux Klan and neo-Nazis running up and down the street? But isn't it fascinating that our theology does not push people of God away from those kinds of practices? As a matter of fact, if you talk to some church folk, they'll tell you, well, if you do the crime, you got to do the time. And I'd be like, just show me the chapter and verse on that. Just just because, you know, because they get real holy when they do it. You know, well, oh, pastor, if you do the time crime you got to do the time <sighs> and you just like oh wow that must have Jesus must have said that the way you got deep that quick <laughs> so one of the challenges you and I have is how do we untangle the hatred that is acceptable from the hatred that is not that resides in our hearts. Let me give you a first question. Let me give you a first question. First question. The first question that I need you to think about, amen, is have you wrestled with the hate evil that resides within? What evil must be faced so it can be overcome? Again, I want us, as we prepare to move out in a public kind of confrontation with this hatred that's coming to our community, I want us to do that because that's so necessary. But I don't want us to let ourselves off the hook. And when the Ku Klux Klan leave town, we feel better because we ran them out of town. But evil is still lurking in our heart. Wouldn't that be a shame if you and I let the big devil run out of town but left all the devil's homies <laughs> right along here with you? If I'm going to run the devil out of town, I want all of the devil gone. Hello, somebody. 
All right. Second thing you got to do is love good. Somebody say love good. good. Now, again, the way that we deal with hate that resonates is we have to liberate love. And love is, I think, for all intents and purposes, something that has been deposited inside the life of a Christ follower that is getting the kind of uh, 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 rationed distribution, you know, I'm going to love you if, and I'm going to love you when, you know, that's, that's, that's love on rations, you know, that's right, right, conditions, but how many know that, you know, that's not the kind of love that we, we being asked to, to give now, now, I do love people enough to confront you when you're wrong, so me loving you don't mean you get to just get a pass. People tell me, well, Pastor Mike, you just let them come and go and don't give them so much energy. I say, well, I love them too much to let them come through my town and me not stand up and tell them no. No, 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 no. Now, you know, let's come down to our own. Can you imagine what it would look like if you let all the things in your life that you must confront just pass because it's, you know, hey, just ignore, ignore it. Let all the things the in things your life, life that you must confront just and if pass. If I just ignore them, they'll just pass. Anybody? Anybody? No, no, that don't work. If you ignore evil, evil will expand. Evil will grow. And before long, evil will be all-consuming. So we have to confront evil as evil manifests, but we cannot confront evil with evil. We must confront evil with good. Hatred with love. And love is a strength. It is arguably the strongest, most powerful force in the world, in creation, in history. Why? Because love was so powerful, it moved God. For God so loved the world. Think about that for a second. It was not God's condemnation of the world or judgment of the world that moved the unmovable one into action. But love as a force moved God out of God's place of safety and privilege just so you and I could have a chance to say yes to a new way of existence. It is that love that you and I are being asked to unleash to the world without condition. It is that kind of love that's in you, child of God. And that love don't make sense to everybody else. Folks think you crazy. Folk think you just some spiritual fuddy-duddy. Folk think you're not practical. But take a look at everyone else's best effort without love. When you try to get what you think you deserve without love, you oppress. When you try to repay without love, you harm. When you even try to defend without love, you become a person who assaults and is the source of violence. Love. Love is, the scripture says, that which covers a multitude, a whole lot of sins. Love is the wet blanket on your fire and condemnation. And it is that which you and I must do. Question then, second question. How is the love of the good resisting the hatred of this world? And what spiritual practices are you employing to increase your appetite to love the good? How many of you know if you don't feed love, you won't have love to give? You have to do everything you can to feed love. So if you listen to music that is encouraging you to do harm, 
Why don't you fast from that for a little while? If the pundit tree is feeding you in such a way where you find yourself moving in the opposite direction of love, you should turn that off for a while. If your friends, homies, ace spoon coons, partners, aces, if they are keeping you from the love that God has placed inside of you, you may have to find you some new friends. But you and I got to prioritize love at all costs or we will die. And I don't know about you, I'm not willing to die because I hate somebody else that much. When God has called us to live. Final thing, work it out. Somebody say work it out. Work it out in the public square. What does it mean for you to work out your love? Dare I say, what does it mean to work out your hatred? How many know we got to work all of it out? If you don't work out your hatred, if you don't work out the evil, then that stuff will stay in your system like a toxin. And it will poison you. It will poison you. That's why I believe we should do justice ministry because it makes your heart less wicked, makes my heart less wicked. When we put ourselves in a position to love folk with our actions and not just our words, it makes us more aligned with God's will and work. I love this quote by Mother St. Teresa of Avila. 11th century mystic, she says, Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which Christ looks compassion into the world. Yours are the feet with which Christ walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which Christ blesses the world. When love resonates, um, when hate resonates, our love must liberate 